God of War is, above all else, a story about a father and his son, and how the two of them slowly come to know and understand one another, and how they help each other grow as people. But while that is indeed the heart of the entire game's story, there is just so much more that's going on. Like all great stories, this game's strengths lie in its strong writing and character development, but also like all great stories, those are far from being its only strengths. Because while this is a very personal story about a father-son relationship, it's also a story about gods and giants and the ever-present looming threat of the end of the world and everything in it. Before we move ahead, warning, there are major spoilers ahead for God of War. Turn back now if you have not finished the game. Much like its precursors that were steeped in the events of Greek mythology, so too is the new God of War set in the backdrop of Scandinavian mythology, in a time before the Vikings ruled the land. And this backdrop is so much more than just stage dressing. It's there not because it would just be cool to have as a location set in the game, but because it's fundamental to so much that happens in the story. And while Norse mythology is inherently truly fascinating, this game's particular take on Norse mythology is a very interesting one. Why? Because it treats it with the appropriate gravity and respect, and it is so faithful to it that understanding Norse mythology could also clue you in to where the sequels will end up heading. And yet, at the same time, it isn't too faithful to it either. It doesn't follow everything to the letter, and it puts its own unique spin on things every now and then, making it all fit within the context of the series, rather than it being the other way around. And so, while a person with great knowledge of the mythology could possibly have an idea about what's going to happen next, this game also makes sure to do things its own way, so that you can never be too sure about whether or not the stuff you think is going to happen will actually end up happening. Nothing feels like it doesn't make sense. Of course, it doesn't have to, as is evidenced by Marvel's adaptation of Norse mythology. A story can be full of inaccuracies and still be really, really good. These are, after all, fiction, not accurate accounts and retellings of their source material. But the game's genius is that it tells the story it wants to tell, but does so while being surprisingly accurate to the mythology it is based off of. The example most emblematic of that is, of course, the game's final big revelation. The fact that Atreus is Loki. Yes, THE Loki, the Norse god of mischief. For anyone who doesn't know much about Norse mythology and plays God of War, the very last minutes of the game would be, at most, a cool twist. But if you have some knowledge of the source material, you begin to realize just how well it fits. As per Norse mythology itself, Loki is considered an honorary veneer, so to speak but he isn't actually as guardian. He is a giant, the son of Lafe and Farbadi. He is also a shapeshifter who can transform into any animal and is most often associated with wolves. He is in fact also the father of Jormungandr, the world serpent, and Fenrir, the wolf, among others. In the game, of course, Loki's mother is also revealed to be a giant named Fey, short for Lafe. While in the murals in Jotunheim, right at the end, Kratos is also referred to as Farbadi. In fact, Kratos is, as you might remember, the grandson of Kronos, the king of titans, and though titans and giants aren't necessarily the same thing, it still works surprisingly well. As Kratos reveals to his son at the end, Atreus is the name he was given at birth, but Fey initially wanted to name him Loki, which is the name the giants use while referring to him. Atreus' runic summons in the game also are in keeping with the fact that he is, in fact, Loki. All of them involve him summoning animals, with the very first summon you unlock for him being one that summons, you guessed it, a wolf. So Loki's heritage and characteristics as per the mythology itself remains intact, while also still allowing him to be the son of Kratos and it making perfect sense. It also makes sense that Loki, or Atreus, is able to interact with the world serpent in the game, because even though he is his father, the serpent is actually from the future, knocked back in time by a force of a deadly blow from Thor during Ragnarok, as Mimir explains. So Loki is admittedly yet to give birth to Jormungandr, but since the Jormungandr he interacts with is from the future, it all still works. Speaking of Ragnarok, the game's take on the world-ending event of Scandinavian mythology and everything it entails is also a fascinating one. It remains true to the source material for the most part, but it does so while making it all fit within the context of the narrative of both itself and the games that preceded it. 
As per Norse mythology, Ragnarok is supposed to be the cataclysmic event centered around the war between the Vanir and the Jotun, an event that will bring about the apocalypse itself. As per the myth, when Loki causes the death of Baldur through the use of mistletoe, the one thing in all of the cosmos that can physically harm him, it triggers the event of Fimble Winter, a winter that lasts for three years and leads directly into Ragnarok itself. And this too fits perfectly within the events portrayed in the game. Early on in the game, Atreus is gifted a bunch of mistletoe arrows by Sindri as a token of gratitude after Kratos and Atreus kill a dragon and save his life. In a seemingly innocuous and insignificant moment a while later, Kratos sees that one of the straps of Atreus' quiver is broken and uses one of the arrowheads to fix it. Later on, when Kratos and Atreus meet Freya, who is, of course, the mother of Baldur, Freya sees the mistletoe arrows and she panics, fearful of the possibility of them either harming or possibly killing her son, and so she burns them, all except for one tiny piece that is fastened to Atreus' quiver. Ultimately, later on in the game's climax, Baldur punches Atreus in the chest in what is an absolutely genius scene, and the arrowhead fastened to Atreus' quiver's straps pierces Baldur's hand. This breaks the spell that makes him immune to all physical pain, giving Kratos the opportunity to ultimately kill him. Doing so, of course, kicks off Fimble Winter, as Mimir tells the father and son that they've done something that has blown the events of Ragnarok out of schedule and brought them forward. The game runs with the idea of Kratos' son being Loki and makes it all work perfectly. It does it so well, in fact, that looking at the source material can give us some pretty good clues about what might happen next in the series. Loki is said to have an uncomfortable relationship with the Asgardians, often aiding and counseling them in several matters, but eventually going on to be the one that causes their ultimate downfall, which is what leads us to believe that Atreus might possibly be switching sides, at least temporarily in the future games. Remember, he still doesn't know a lot about Kratos' past, except for the fact that he killed his own father. He doesn't know that Kratos basically caused the destruction of all of Greece during the events of God of War 3, or that he killed his own wife and daughter. Is it not possible that Odin, being the master manipulator that he is, might try to use this information to sow discord between Kratos and Atreus to try to get the latter on his side? The effects might be temporary. By the time this particular story comes to an end, Loki and his children will obviously not be on the side of the veneer, but it's entirely conceivable that it does, in fact, end up happening. Since the launch of the game, creative director Corey Barlog has mentioned on several occasions that with Atreus, the new God of War games are going to tell the origin story, so to speak, of Loki. And while it's true that Atreus is very much his own character rather than being a one-to-one -one adaptation of the one portrayed in the mythologies, it's still very exciting to think of the possibilities of just how this kid will transform into the shape-shifting trickster that the world knows as Loki. It's also entirely possible that time travel will be a huge plot point in God of War sequels. Hell, given the series' propensity to meddle with time and causality, it's almost a certainty. Jormungandr's presence before Kratos and Atreus has already established that time in this particular chapter of the series' story isn't going to be any more linear than it has been in the past. While there have also been several other hints throughout the game that suggest that movement across time across different realms is quite different. This, of course, leads us to our next theory. Could Kratos at some point in the story travel back in time to bring the giants of Jotunheim to the present to fight in Ragnarok? The game's very last scenes show us all giants, even the ones in Jotunheim, are dead. Ragnarok, though, is supposed to be a war on a massive scale between the Jotun and the Vanir. However, how exactly is that supposed to happen if there are no Jotun left in all of the Nine Realms? Perhaps in an echo of what happened in God of War 2, Kratos might bring back an army of giants with him from the past to fight against the gods in Ragnarok. Unlike God of War 2, however, this wouldn't be in as much of danger of creating a time paradox in the story, because here, even as per Norse mythology itself, the giants were very much still a factor during Ragnarok. Recently, we interviewed Cory Barlog, and among the many, many things we spoke of was God of War's use of Norse mythology, and how, while making use of it, it tries to strike a balance between being accurate and telling the story it wishes to tell you. You can listen to the one-hour-long spoiler cast in the description below. And Norse mythology, Barlog mentions, is perfect for that kind of thing, because not only are there multiple sources and multiple accounts of the mythologies, leading to several different interpretations, God of War itself is also set during the time when accounts for all of these events were a long, long way away from being written. 
That is a decision Barlog and the writers consciously made, a decision that led them to take the kind of liberties that may be at odds with some accounts of Norse myths, but also not completely implausible. For instance, in the game, Freya takes on a role that many might associate with the mythological figure known as Frigg. According to several sources of Norse mythology, it was Frigg who married Odin and gave birth to Baldr, and it was Frigg who put a spell on her son that would prevent him from any and all physical and mental pain. As per these accounts, Freya was Frigg's sister. But then again, there are also several sources that claim that Freya and Frigg are actually the same person, who were bifurcated into different people by subsequent accounts and retellings as time went on. This is just another example that shows us that even in taking liberties and diverting away from what might be considered accurate, the game does so in a way that is authentic to the source material itself. Most impressive, however, is the fact that in doing all of this, it remains true not only to the mythologies themselves, but also to the history of the series as well. This still very much feels like a God of War story, and Kratos, his past, and all of the baggage that he carries feels like a crucial part to the narrative. Rather than reshaping the franchise to make it fit within the context of Norse mythology, the game does the opposite, and it does so very, very smartly. Among several other achievements, Sony Santa Monica deserves to be lauded for that. And that about does it for this video. If you enjoyed what you watched and want to see more from Gaming Bolt, you can always hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell icon next to it. That way you will never miss any of our videos.